Hello, gluten armed. Thanks for joining everybody. Today I'll be showing you how to make an amazing world class top notch overnight sourdough bread. I already made the dough. I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, we'll be talking about how much water you should be using for your sourdough. Uh, we'll have another close look at dough strength, which is important to knead or not to knead because I've been doing a couple of uh, no knead tutorials recently. Um, we'll be talking about extracting a small fermentation sample, how that works. And uh, then we'll also talk how to use that and always ferment your sourdough on time. So bear with me, I'll be showing you everything today. And uh, today is also a little bit special because there are dial-in credentials inside of the description. So if you're crazy, if you wanna ask me some questions, uh, we have some time in between, I guess, then please join and uh, you'll be live inside of the stream. And first of all, have a look at my lovely uh, Christmas sweater. Go Jesus, it's your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so gluten oven, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be switching the camera now. If you have questions, please feel free to hit me up with the questions. I'll do my best to also answer them while I'm performing but I'm a little bit bad at multitasking. I'm more of the single tasking person. So yeah, I'm Hendrik and uh, I'm actually from Hamburg, Germany. Where's everybody here in the stream from? Ah, I see a couple of names I've seen before. So yeah, hello. And I'm gonna switch the camera now. Give me a second. Camera switched. Ah, okay, I think the camera is good. Just going to be moving this a little bit. Toronto, Chicago. Hi, Danville. Hi, Zoe. Hi, C. Fazio, Chicago. I hope it's not too uh, cold these days in Chicago. California, Tennessee, Brugge, and Czech Republic. <laughs> All around the world. Nice. That's amazing. Okay, let me just check that this works with the autofocus. I think you are able to see the dough, right? So what I did already in advance, I uh, prepared the dough and this is called the auto laser. So what I did is I just mixed flour and water. And at the same time, I also prepared my sourdough starter. This does not contain any salt yet. So this is the main dough that I already prepared. And let me actually try another thing. Um, I'm gonna be trying to share my screen now. I think you're able to see the screen now. <laughs> and um, let's just quickly have a look at uh, the full process. I hope you're able to see my screen. <laughs> so um, pretty much what we're doing right now is number one and number two, this I already did pretty much. We are now looking at step number three, mixing the ingredients. Now, this is an overnight tutorial. This is for my default tutorial, but this is for an overnight tutorial. So we will be doing everything now, number three and number four. And number five, shaping the bread, proofing the bread and baking. That's something that I'll be doing tomorrow morning. So five, six and seven is not part of the stream, only three and four, okay. Then one additional thing that I wanted to talk about. So what's very important is how much water you're using for your flour. And actually, is everybody able to see my screen? I think so. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Um, so how much water am I using for my flour? And this is something that took me a while to figure out. I was just baking Frisbee after Frisbee. And because I just followed random values from the internet. You have to adjust how much water you're using depending on your flour. That's very important. The protein inside of your flour is responsible for absorbing a lot of the water. So if you see a crazy, incredibly beautiful open crumb bread, for instance, on the internet, then chances are it might not work with the flour that you have. So that's why I built you this small table showing based on how much, um, how much protein your flour has how much water you should be using. And this is the default values that I'm using for my no need brand. And those are also values that I recommend you to use, especially when you get started. 
what you can do is afterwards when you see, okay, everything is going fine, then you can up, uh, upgrade those values just a little bit. But those values are definitely going to work all the time for your flower. So if you have 10 to 12%, then based on the flower, 60%, that's Baker's math, that would be then 300 grams of uh, water. So the bakers always like to use this so that they can stay, scale up or down if they want to bake multiple loaves at the same time. And in this case, I have the 15% uh, protein inside of my flour. That's I'll be going for 70%, or I might actually also have used 75%. I'm not 100% sure, but in my case, I know my flour, so that's okay. So the lesson that I wanted to give you here, sorry for going so much in theory, is you need to adapt this depending on the flour that you have at hand. So very important, something I did wrong all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> skull and crossbones, yes. <laughs> so what you can definitely do, oh, hi to India as well, Christopher Feig, hi to Denmark. What you can do is you can be mixing some wheat gluten into your flour if you have a poor flour to make your flour a little bit better. That's something that you can definitely do. The amount of protein you have inside of your flour, either bakers are adding this as gluten directly, or it depends on uh, the quality of the wheat. So the more sun you have in general, the more protein you have. So some mills which are not adding anything, they just pick the best types of wheat which they have at hand. So also something good to know. <laughs> Um, Derek Hina, what if you have a flower bed? How do you calculate the water? So I actually have a video on this upcoming soon and I did it in the past. I would recommend you to do a little bit of a test. So I would test different hydrations, um, maybe do one bowl with 60, one with 65, one with 70% hydration, and then just work yourself up until you feel this, feel this value is good for your dough. This is how I always approach a new flower. This is bread flour and a little bit of whole wheat flour added. Ariel's asking how much wheat, uh, wheat gluten. I recommend to go for 15%. Uh, make sure to mix everything properly. And then you have to do a little bit of uh, math to calculate. So for 500, let's say your flour has 10% right now. For 500, you would need to add 25 grams of wheat gluten to bounce up to 15%. Uh, can you use seitan flour as gluten for baking cow? That's actually a great question. I am not sure. I just have eaten seitan sausages before, but I'm not sure. Maria Fury, hey to New Zealand. <laughs> yes, free of pandemic. Okay, so back to this dough here. By the way, so there's dial-in information. So in case you want to uh, jump on the show as well and talk to me, that's something you can do. It's in the description of the stream. Okay, the autolysis I showed you before. I just mixed flour and water, no salt yet. And I just wanted to show you how well this dough already developed. Do you see this? This is an excellent um, gluten network. This is perfect. And all this simply by waiting. So I just mixed flour and water, homogenized everything for around a minute. And then I just pretty much waited. And by waiting, you get this amazing dough without it tearing. This is excellent gluten development. Note how I'm always wetting my hands a little bit. This makes touching the dough a little bit easier. So yeah, this is um, a very good looking dough. If you know your dough, your gluten network tears, then you might want to add a little bit more flour, make sure to measure everything so that the next time you can do everything right. <laughs> Ciso. Oh, yes, that sounds good. <laughs> Johannes Dörr, I know this guy. Johannes is the best camera man on the world. We have actually been doing a video together inside of a mill in Bavaria. The video is coming out soon. So Johannes is a very dangerous camera guy. <laughs> okay, this is looking good. I'm now going to be adding the salt and the sourdough starter. One thing that you need to know is how much sourdough starter you're going to add now to your flour. And I'll just be jumping quickly to a small table that I developed. And let me share my screen one more time. Oh, 
One second, it's loading. Okay, so I'm hoping I can share my screen now. Da -da -dum, there you go. Uh, Ta-da! Okay, I think you can see my screen. So you can find the table at table.thebreadcode.io. And pretty much what this table shows you, depending on the temperature you have inside of your room, and depending on how much sourdough starter you are using, for how long you should typically ferment your bread. So that's bulk fermentation time and proofing time. So let's have a look now. We I currently have 21 degrees here. So the bulk fermentation is going to be around seven hours and the proofing time around four hours. However, those values always have to be taken with a grain of salt. I know, for instance, right now that in my case, I'm more closer to this or to this value. And to always ferment on time, I'll be showing you a quick little hack in just a little bit. But those are just some rough ballpark figures that you can use uh, to figure out for how long you should ferment. OK, so then um, now let's go back to the dough and add our sourdough starter. <laughs> Kumi, hi to Poland. Uh, so. Anat, what if you add sunflower seeds and nuts? You should be adding them now. So if you wanted to add additions to your dough, which is a great thing to do, then you should be adding them right at this particular moment. So while I'm adding the sourdough starter, you should also be adding nuts and whatever other crazy additions you want to be adding. There are some, of course, which soak out a little bit of hydration, so you have to test. OK, salt. Boom. <laughs> Baker's math, 2%. This overall is 500 grams of flour, so 2% of that. Official recommendation by the European Union for bread. That's 10 grams of salt, a good value to know. And starter, I will be opting for... Mm, I wish you could smell this. Such a nice starter. It's a rice starter, and I just love using a rice starter. It adds so much incredible taste. I will be using... 50 grams, that's 10% now. Ah, yes, I actually <laughs> nailed it. It's 52, but that's it. totally okay. So the starter, let me put this to the side. And now it's a little bit of kneading time. We will be adding those strength now. And those strength is kneading. You could be using a kitchen machine as well if you wanted to. I just like to spread the sourdough a little bit everywhere. That just makes uh, incorporating easier. I typically do this for around three minutes until I note that the sourdough has been evenly incorporated into the dough. Note how it sticks right now, and later on it's not going to stick. That's what I wanted to show you. <laughs> All right, so I'm now taking the dough. I'm lifting it and then I'm folding it over and I'm using my uh, my fist here to just push into the dough. This is what I'm doing. There are other techniques as well, but I like this technique. It's quite efficient and it feels good. Note how the dough is tearing right now a little bit. That's really nothing to worry about. We will be fixing that in just a little bit. This is something that you also have to do on a no-knead bread. For a no-knead bread, you should be using a little bit less uh, water. This makes sure that you have a strong gluten network when you're not kneading. Now, what is the better option? Ha, it's hard to say. What I personally like about the no-knead breads that I've done in the past is that they solely focus on the fermentation process. <laughs> One of you suggested you should drink a shot whenever I say fermentation. Yeah, I like to say this uh, word quite a lot. <laughs> fermentation, fermentation, fermentation. Okay, you're drunk now. So the noni bread solely focuses on the fermentation process, which is, I would say, 80 to 90% of everything when baking sourdough bread. It's really crucial. If you master this one parameter, then you'll be automatically baking better bread. And that's what I like. 
other recipes call for a little bit more kneading and everything. That's nice and cool. But if you don't ferment on time, then yeah, you can do whatever you want. If you don't ferment on time, you will have uh, either a flat bread that won't be fluffy or any other defect. You won't get that ear, you won't get that oven spring. And uh, that's why fermentation is so crucial. You want to inflate that dough. This sourdough that we now added, this mix mixture of yeast and bacteria, that's really going to inflate this dough. I made some videos before on reducing the acidity of your sourdough starter, for instance. It's also important because we have to find that sweet spot. We don't want to over ferment. We have to ferment this dough perfectly on point on time. And I'll be showing you exactly how to do that. And that's what I love uh, all about this overnight sourdough bread. You are just lazy, you go to bed, you sleep, and the next morning you'd likely have a bread ready to be shaped, proofed, and then can be eaten. <laughs> this is really great, let's say, if you wanted to have a bread ready at lunchtime or so. See here, this is not good. We did not incorporate everything properly, so I have to do that a little bit more. <laughs> okay, I'm just reading some of the comments now. June, how much flour and water? I, you must have missed it. So I wrote the full recipe also inside of the description of the video, but just to repeat, this is 400 grams of bread flour, 100 grams of whole wheat flour, and then now 10% of sourdough starter. Nope, nope, yes. Uh, Food Geek is from Denmark. I am from the Germany. We are both engineers, so that's true. He's a great guy. If you're not subscribed, I definitely suggest you to check out his channel. <laughs> Hiramas asks, is there a secret that for a beautiful ear in the bread? Yes, you have to ferment on point. <laughs> that's the secret. You want to inflate everything. See, Fazio, in the new year, you would like to see me make a 100% write-off. Actually, I did. If you check for Roggen Sauerteigbrot on my YouTube channel, there is a 100% rye bread recipe. That's what we Germans love. We love uh, <laughs> we love rye. Susie Kwan challenges me to say 15. <laughs> so I, uh, viewers will know that I have an issue saying 15 and 50. So every third comment is... This this random dude saying 15 or 50. So 15, 15. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Marky says, you have a starter at 100% rye. Uh, okay. So um, I like to make a rye starter. It's also a little bit more active in my experience, but you can also feed your flower different, as uh, you can feed your starter different flowers Nothing to worry. I'm happy now with how this dough looks. I put everything together. I don't see big chunks of starter left. And this is looking good. And one trick now, we will be letting this sit for one, five, 15 minutes. And you will be surprised how much easier it is to work with this dough afterwards. So be lazy about this, be as lazy as possible. Wait, this gluten is going to develop itself simply by waiting. Ta-da, hello. <laughs> uh, the ratio of starter, oh, my hands. The ratio of starter, that's 10% starter. I will be switching now to my other camera while we are waiting. Hello, it's me again. <laughs> So nada, yes, 10% uh, sourdough started for this overnight bread. Oops, you could also be using a little bit less if you wanted to have a longer fermentation process. You should make sure that your dough does not stay for longer than 24 hours at room temperature. That's important because else the flour starts to degrade a little bit. So I like to all these, so that's the uh, flour and water mixture overnight, but overall your dough should not be longer than 24 hours at room temperature. So um, then D Michigan asks, can we add the starter to the water before mixing in the flour? It seems that it would make it easier to mix in. Yes, 
So you could be doing that. However, this process of autolysis, that's just mixing flour and water and then waiting a little bit, that creates so much dough strength simply by waiting. So we will have a very, very tightly, uh, tightly shaped dough already pretty much. And that makes it so much easier. We don't have to knead as much. If we weren't to do that, we would have to uh, knead maybe um, another, another 10 minutes or so right now. So that would work. Um, but I like to use this autolysis, especially overnight. So what I do is I prepare the starter, I prepare the dough, and typically then I wait overnight in the morning I mix everything together. Give this a shot. This autolysis is really a big game changer to me. Uh, Amund asks, would you recommend freezing half-baked bread? Yes, actually, that's a great idea to do for buns. When you want to uh, do buns, for instance, then I don't bake them completely. I bake them half almost so that they don't have the coloring. And then one day later or a week later, two weeks later, I can just simply um, uh, heat them up again and I have fresh buns. So that's actually a really good idea. Thomas Hilaire asks, I have a question about my rye bread. It looks more like buckwheat mix, not like your that looks like foam. Hmm. I would need to see that starter. But um, if it increases in size, if the scent is a little bit vinegary, a little bit acidic, then it's typically good to go. Oh, and by the way, the float test does not work for a rice starter. So you will see the float test sometimes, people doing that. But that only works when you have a bread flour starter or so some starter which has a high gluten amount, just FYI. So, Kumi666 asks, um, in the sandwich bread video, you suggest a dough size increase. And for 12%, you suggest less than doubling. Yes. So I actually corrected that because in one of my videos, I think the last sourdough recipe you ever need, I had um, doubling in size. And it was OK sometimes, but I didn't get consistent results. So based on what I know now these days, I need to correct that. I would not recommend you to go as much in size increase if you don't have that much protein. Reason being, you have this gluten network and the acid of your dough attacks the gluten network over time. So the longer you, you ferment, the more degraded your gluten network is going to be, also known as gluten rot. And this means for a high protein bread, you can ferment longer, you can increase it more in size, whereas for a dough, that does not have that much protein, you can't increase it in size that much, you might have a sticky dough in the end over fermentation, the nightmare of every baker. <laughs> Hope that helps. Uh, Jesus Lara, how many times did you feed your sardo starter and how many times did you wait to mix it with the rest of the dough? Um, I have a great YouTube video on this, four tips to get your sourdough starter more active. Ideally, you should um, feed it over a couple of days. I always suggest a one to five to five ratio. That's 10 grams of starter, 50 grams of flour, and 50 grams of uh, water. And then I do that over a couple of days. And then when I see my starter doubles within five to 10 hours in size, then it's ready to be used. Ah, I actually see somebody just joined the stream, Herman the German. However, it says devices not connected. So maybe there's something you have to check with your camera settings before I can let you in. <laughs> Amy Tan, hi from Malaysia. Hi, how's it going? Hi to see you. Nice to see you. Patrick Bosch, do you have 100% spilled starter and bread? Nope, I don't. Actually, there's going to be a video coming out, which I'm very excited. Johannes, the cameraman, was in the chat before. We have visited a mill in Bavaria. And finally, we actually edited all the footage. It needs to have one more video. And that video is going to be how the best or about how the best organic flour is made. We'll be going through the full process in Bavaria, check out how everything is done. And we will also deep dive a little bit on spilt, which is really interesting. So too long didn't watch um, the spelt flour. The modern spelt is very similar to wheat flour. So it's a crossbreed typically. And so the modern spelt that you can find, you can typically replace it one-to-one -one in a wheat-based recipe. So just FYI, 
new spelled is very similar to wheat in properties. However, the old spelled, the traditional spelled, is a completely different story. It's more like a rye, einkorn, or emmer when you bake it. So almost no gluten, just something interesting. So when people say, I always only eat spelled, then it's actually, yeah, I need to ask, what spelled are you eating? Okay, uh, Mirko asks, how many times do you make bread per week? <laughs> uh, a few times, probably every second day or so. So I do like to make a lot of bread. Sizo, <laughs> uh, Ozama, see you later. Good luck on that baking. Um, he makes amazing bread. I've seen so many of his pictures. <laughs> Isabel says, I cut all your times to three to four factors. So warm. Yes, in Florida, it's very warm. Then you have to adjust. And that's also one of the key messages. Depending on the temperature, you have to adjust. But I got you covered. Stay with me for a little bit longer, and I'll show you an amazing hack that will always make you ferment on time. Dr. Nijzo McCordelfak, are you ever going to take a step at baguettes? Yes, I have done it many times before. But me personally, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So I like to master one recipe completely before I uh, proceed with the next recipe. So first I need to finish a couple of other things and uh, then we are ready to go at baguettes. So Herman the German is back. Let me just quickly clean my hands so that I can coordinate my computer. <laughs> Ah, uh, Caro, gluten rot. Yeah, that's actually an official term. Be right back. Okay, I'm back. So Herman the German, are you around? You are officially invited to speak if you want. <laughs> Hello, Herman. Are, Hello. You, are you able to hear me? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. <laughs> are you from the Germany? Yes, I am. Another German, where are you from? Which area? Berlin. Ah, nice, beautiful city. Been working there for, I think, two years, close to Maybach, Ufa. All right. And you're another fellow baker, so what are you baking? Oh, I, I love sourdough bread, and I've started like watching your channel. It's got some great tips. Oh, thank you very much. And what kind of bread are you baking then? Um, well, I've used some of your recipes, so I've been using like um, rye flour and Okay. Dinkel to afternoon silver. Okay. Try to do some sourdough. Okay. And is there a particular question you would like to ask? Yes, actually, yes. Um, so I've been using one of your recipes, but my last two breads they they didn't really have a nice crust. And okay. I wonder why. So with crust, you mean it should be a little bit crispier? Yeah, it goes soft. It was too soft, and you want to have it a little bit crispier. Yeah. Okay. Are you baking using a Dutch oven? Are you baking using a tray? How do you bake? I'm using a Dutch oven. Okay. Is that one made out of um, iron? Yes. It's a thick okay. one. It's a thick one. So uh, for the Dutch oven, I typically bake around 25 minutes, lid closed, and then another 20 minutes uh, without the lid. For how long are you baking? I've done 20 minutes lit on and then 20 minutes lit off. Okay. And so what you can do is the last 20 minutes, so the first 20 minutes I would say is set because you only have oven spring for the first 10 minutes or so overall of the bake. So afterwards, it's pretty much just crust development. What you can do is you can just leave your bread for 30 minutes inside of the oven afterwards if you like. So rather than 20 minutes in the end, maybe 30 minutes until the crust has reached the desired uh, dark uh, 
coloring that you prefer. But if it's getting darker and darker, like I'm just afraid of burning it. Isn't that an issue? Um, that depends on you, how you like the taste. So if you want to have a thicker crust, then you need to let it stay in the oven for a little bit longer. What you can do is you can take a small thermometer and put that into your dough and into your bread then. And when that is 95 degrees Celsius, then your bread is pretty much uh, ready. So that's something you can always do to just measure. And then you can go a little bit on the darker side. So I actually personally, I like my bread relatively dark. I like that thick crust. Uh, but of course, you want to make sure that it does not burn. All right. And one cool trick other than that is also after you're done baking, leave your bread inside of your hot oven. You have done but that. Just, and just leave the door of the um, oven a little bit open. Yeah. It's also going to develop a little bit of a better crust then. Okay, well, I've been doing some of those things, but um, I'll try maybe lowering the temperature. Maybe that's going to help in, in the last 20 minutes, because if it's too hot, I think it's just going to burn. And what temperature are you baking? Well, the first 20 minutes, I go for around 260. And mm -hmm. then the last 20 is probably around 220. Ah, okay, so I bake only at 230 all the time. Okay. So I, I preheat the oven to max, which in my case is around 270 degrees Celsius. Sorry, by the way, Americans, I have no idea how much that is in Fahrenheit. Um, so uh, preheat to the max and then 25 minutes with steam at 230 and then another 20 at 230. I'll try that. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other question you would like to ask? Not really. I think it's really funny that I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Also, by the way, you don't have such a German accent. Uh, did you did you uh, work abroad or something? I did an exchange here, so. Uh, ah, okay. That's probably why. Yeah, your Ger uh, accent is much better than mine. But I can do the German. I can do the German. <laughs> do the German. <laughs> ja, dann vielen Dank, dass du dich eingewählt hast. Hat mich sehr gefreut. Ja, und Deutsch. bei Fragen jederzeit melden und schöne Weihnachten wünsche ich dir. Ja, dir auch. Alles klar. Okay, bis dann. Ciao. Mhm. So, thank you, Herman. That was an excellent question. So, if you have more questions, uh, please feel free to dial in to the stream as well. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm now going to be switching back to the dough because I think it has been 15 minutes. And uh, then we can have a look at how the dough developed. I'm very excited. So starter has been mixed into this dough. That was just 10% because we are doing an overnight bread. Salt has also been added. And uh, let's check now. Now I'm going to show you how you will always ferment your bread on time. <laughs> and Egan, good morning, Hendrik. Hello, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Uh, Amund Hannes asks, is it possible to get, get a great crust with whole wheat bread? Um, yes, it's also, it's also possible. However, whole wheat is a completely different game. My next video, this next to the mill video, is going to be a whole wheat sandwich bread. I'll be covering that a little bit in detail. So that might be something you want to check out. <laughs> Jose, hello to Spain. How's it going? Nice to see you around as well. Um, okay. All right, let's go back to the dough. I'll switch that. I'm sorry if I can't answer all the questions right now. I hope I have time later. And if you want, you can definitely dial in just like Herman did. Be brave. Feel free to show your dough if you have something or your bread and ask me for some of the feedback. Just changing the camera again now. And here we go. <laughs> Chopin, have you ever done a condensed milk bread? No, I've never done that. That should work. Jose, que pasa? And Dirk Digler, freundlich, freundliche Weihnachten aus Neuseeland. Hi, ni hi to New Zealand. Nice to have you around. Derek asks, why don't you include the sourdough hydration inside of the calculation? Uh, many people have asked this question, and that's actually a very good question. So thanks for asking. That's because... Bakers don't like complicated math. You're right, it should be included. However, the recipes they use, they always accommodate already for that small or that slight um, variation. So just to simplify things, 
bakers uh, don't go for the full 100% science approach there. <laughs> Danville, how's it going? Tip on the crust, turn off the oven, leave the door slightly open. Yes, that's a really good uh, trick. <laughs> Uh, gamer mice, can you add bananas into it, into the bread? Yes, you can. Uh, bananas are probably 95% water. You can just crush them and then use banana water to make your bread. Seriously, try that with tomatoes. It's delicious. Hello. Hello, dough. Hello. Let's have a look. And you can see mm, very satisfying gluten development here. The gluten is strong with this dough. This is the way. <laughs> Uh, I wonder how many people know uh, note my Star Wars references. <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm just rounding up the dough a little bit so that I can much easier take it out of the container. And I just do this clockwise a few times until I note that the dough is actually now coming out. <laughs> okay, dough is coming out. Let's place this here on our surface. Oops. Now, what we will be doing is we will be extracting a small fermentation sample. And this fermentation sample will tell you exactly when your dough is done fermenting. Sorry, I'm saying too much fermenting again. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> so what we will do is we will extract a small piece of this dough. We can add it later or we can bake it with a little bit of oil in a pan as an English muffin. And then we mark this with a rubber band. And this is going to tell us exactly when our dough is done fermenting. And this is so much easier than checking for times because now in Germany it's so cold and all the doughs ferment double the time than they did in summer or three times. And using this simple hack with a small cylindric shaped jar, uh, glass jar like this, you could also be using a shot glass. It should be cylindric shaped you will always ferment on time. Now the question is for how much should the dough increase in size? And I suggested earlier it should be double, but this depends on your flour. The more flour you have, sorry, the more protein your flour has, uh, the more you can inflate it. So if you have less protein, you also have to go for a smaller size increase. And may it be yeast dough, Polish dough, bigger, this is really a great trick to master and it always has you feeling 100% safe about the fermentation process. I got a small chart prepared, which I'll show you, which will show you exactly for how long you should be fermenting. <laughs> oh, how cold is the apartment? Oh, I actually got a small thermometer. Temperature right now, oh, here on the surface, 24, dough temperature around 23 degrees Celsius right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Share screen. I'm sharing the screen again. I hope you are able to see my screen now. Hello. <laughs> and this is the slide that I wanted to show you. Oh, I didn't make a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I just the picture from one of the videos. So here again, depending on your flower, protein percent, how much you should go for in size increase. 10 to 12, very common in Germany for most of the flour you find at the supermarket. By the way, Germans, um, there is no such thing as bread flour in Germany. It's always T550. So all the internet websites have this wrong. It's a translation issue. Type 812 is not bread flour. Bread flour is high quality, all-purpose flour selected from the best wheat that you find or with added gluten. It can be both of those. In this case, I'm having around 15% protein, so I'll be opting for a 70 to 110% size increase. And that's crucial. If you ferment for too long, you could actually max out uh, those doughs, but you have to be very careful. You would run into over-fermentation. Your dough would be very, very sticky. You can then still save it by tossing it into a loaf pan. But this is a good value to aim for. Okay, so stop sharing and let's go back to the dough. And uh, no flowchart and no flowchart yet. Amon asks, you mentioned Biga. How is your experience with it? So 
As far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, the only difference between Poolish and Biga is the hydration that you have inside of your preferment. Other than that, both is done using yeast. And if that's really the case, please correct me if I'm wrong, that's the information that I have. Then it's it's the only thing is different is that you end up adding a little bit more water with the Poolish, which has 100% hydration. Other than that, it should be exactly the same. Oil fins, what's the maximum protein you have ever seen in a flower? I have some seen some flower with 18% protein. I don't know whether that was <laughs> natural. <laughs> Kumi666, do you have an online shop where you buy your flower? Yes. Um, I like to buy flour at Molino Padano, for instance, or Draxmühle in Germany, but sometimes I feel lazy. I just go to the supermarket. It depends a little bit on what I feel like. <laughs> okay, so our, our dough, we will be extracting the small fermentation sample now. For this, a tool like this, a dough scraper is handy. I'm just going to be cutting off a small piece like this. And I don't know how much this is. I guess this is around, 50 grams or so. And then I'm just placing it here into this jar. I want to make sure that it's spread everywhere nicely. One of you suggested to use a shot glass. I think I said it before. That would make things easier. However, I don't have uh, those which are just of cylindric shape. And then what I'm doing is I'm just adjusting this rubber band. And then I will be leaving this close to the main dough. What's important is that this should be ideally room temperature and your dough as well. Because of course, this is going to ferment faster than this, or sorry, I mean, this is going to react faster to temperature changes than your main dough, as this is a little bit smaller. So they should be kept close to each other. Ideally, they should both have room temperature, just to make sure this is not a source of error. And some of you reported this does sometimes not work. And that's why I recommended earlier that it's so incredibly important that you homogenize your dough properly. You want to have the same amount of sourdough starter uh, based on the dough, the ratio pretty much in here and in here. Okay, so in this hack, this sample, give this a shot. This makes things so much easier. And then all I'm doing is I will be taking this and I will be placing this here next to my main dough. And now this is going to sit, and my dough is likely going to be ready tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m. I don't know. I'll just be checking this, and this makes everything really much, much simpler. Okay. I wanted to talk more about dough strength. So this dough does not have that much strength yet, and I'll just be doing a little bit of kneading. First of all, I want to show you how to make that dough nice and smooth. You could be using a dough scraper like this, but I always like to advocate to not use too many tools. So I'll show you how to do that by hand. At a 45 degree angle, we're turning this ugly blob here into a nice round dough. At a 45 degree angle, push inside this finger here as, as is on the bottom of the surface. I'm pushing inside and then I'll be pulling this. And this only works because we did not use any additional flour. That should be a t-shirt. Don't use additional <laughs> flour. I'm using wetted hands. This makes things a little bit easier. Then I'm pushing inside and then I'm pulling over the surface. My two pinkies here push all the way at the bottom of the dough and I'm pulling over the surface. This makes it nice and round. And then I rotate the dough at the same time a little bit. And this is something you should master. This is also important for pre-shaping. And this now gives you the perfect moment to practice this. Look how... <laughs> Satisfying this dough is looking now. What a good looking uh, blob of dough now. I'll show you the same thing using the dough scraper, 45 degrees. This is a little bit simpler to some people, but then you will need to buy another tool as well. Mm. Give this a good massage. Very important. You want to Hey, my dough, please ferment on time for me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta say too, this dough is relatively sexy. <laughs> it 
it almost hurts me that I want to add additional dose strength now to this one because it's already so nice and smooth. Mm. Mm. <laughs> That's what I love about kneading. That's the only thing I don't like about a no-knead recipe that you don't need. I just find it so satisfying to work with a dough. And the more I'm doing this, what you will notice is that the surface at some point is going to start to tear. Oh, yep, it's already happening here. You see that? Because I'm overdoing this. So in case that happens, cry a little. <laughs> then go back, come back after 15 minutes. Sorry, 15, 15 minutes, and then proceed. And it should be good again. Or five minutes also, just that the dough recovers. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael asks, what to do if my dough is super sticky at this point? Too much water for my protein. Yes, then you should be adding more flour, Michael. That's the only thing you can be doing in that case. You should be adding more flour, making sure that your dough looks like that. Ideally, use a scale just to measure this so that you can do this right the next time. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nixo McChul... <laughs> Sorry, I can't pronounce your name, so I'll just be Dr. <coughs> the host has an exotic fixation with the dough. Yes. Uh, no comment. <laughs> Thomas Hilaire is making a dough right now. Um, so you're all eating your bread right now, and you want uh it to rest in the fridge overnight my question is should i reduce the amount of starter so in this case i would leave your dough at room temperature why put it into the fridge if you leave it at room temperature just do it overnight and use 10 percent of starter and then you can proceed in the morning that's what i would do i hope that answers your question you could be using the fridge and actually i have been doing a funny experiment it's actually a fail but i'm going to show it to you anyways so this bread here, it looks like a pancake, right? And you know what's special about this bread? This one took 200 hours to make. I had it sit in the fridge, this dough, using just this sample here, pretty much. So this was sitting in my fridge. I was a little bit annoyed in the end for more than 200 hours. And I just observed this small sample here. That's why the sample is so good, until I saw that this doubled in size. I mean, it's a little bit flat, but the taste of this bread is truly amazing. I think I screwed up a few things here in the process. I wanted to make a video out of this too at some point, but just to show you, this sample had 200 hours in the fridge. <laughs> but a Frisbee, you can throw it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, good. <laughs> A says, this dough is alive and kicking. Yes, you are right. This dough is alive. We unfortunately have been a little bit non-nice to the dough. We tear the surface a little bit. Let's fix that and make our dough happy. See, now it's going to be nice and round and smooth again. At this stage, it's really no problem. But later on, when you round up your dough before shaping, you don't want this to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel, you in sweater, me in shorts and t-shirt. Yes, it's very cold here now. <laughs> um, Thomas Hilaire, overnight, isn't it too long outside of your fridge? Nope, that's not too long. Just use a little bit less starter, 5 or 10% and wait, extract a small sample and then it should be good. <laughs> Mlekulak, this piece can be put back to the bread. Yes, this piece can be put back to the bread. After you're done with the bulk fermentation process, which this is now, you can just easily add the dough back to the, as if you can add the sample back to the main dough. You can just glue them together and everything is going to be good. <laughs> Jonathan Sesse, you should basically use type 550 with added protein, gluten, and germ. Yes, or you can sometimes find um, T550 with around 12% uh, gluten at Rewe or Edeka. Those are German supermarkets to everybody. Just taking a sip of this water. See, I'm such a, I'm such a cheap German. I even just took an old uh, wine bottle, and I'm using that as a water bottle. Mm. Mm. 
So, sehr gut. Next step. We will be adding some more those strings. Now, we will be doing a little bit of kneading. Now, this is completely optional for the level of hydration that I suggested. However, since I wanted to show you how to do it, I'll be doing this now. Consequence, I'm going to have much nicer oven spring, well, guaranteed oven spring, pretty much. So I'm just taking the dough, and what I will do is I will be using the surface here to my advantage. Then I will be gluing the dough together, just like if I was shaping the dough. You can try shaping the dough already now, at this stage. You work with a sticky dough, plus you add a lot of strength. Note how sticky the dough is. I'm trying to just touch it slightly with my hands. If I note <coughs> it starts to stick too much, uh, I'm just wetting my hands a little bit. This is really a lifesaver. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now same thing as shaping. I'm taking the dough out, pushing this over, and then I'm rolling up the dough. And note how sticky this dough is right now. But I now shaped the dough pretty much. Same technique as shaping. It's not as nice now because the dough wasn't so round. With shaping, we use a little bit of flour so the dough doesn't stick to the surface. But by practicing shaping now, I added all that dough strength and I learned something about shaping. That's what I like about this. Now, let's make this nice and round again. Round and round. <laughs> The slap is always very important. <laughs> I feel this dough sometimes wants to slap me. <laughs> you have not been nice. I'm going to turn into very, very, very sour bread. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just be letting this sit for another uh, five minutes, and then I'll be doing another set of bench kneading. Let me just quickly clean my hands. Hands, 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 hands. <laughs> and if you want to dial in, now is the time. The dial in credentials are inside of the description. So if you want to show me your bread, ask me some questions, just like Herman did, feel free to do. I'll be back in one minute. Just need to clean my hands. Well, not one minute, 20 seconds probably. <laughs> So, okay, let me switch my camera again. Hello again, hello. <laughs> okay, let's uh, also quickly go back to the full process so that you know where we are right now at which stage. We have now, been mixing all the ingredients, we have also extracted the fermentation sample. Sorry, just had to fix the sink. We extracted the fermentation sample. So now all we need to do is we need to wait until our dough has reached the desired size increase. And that's pretty much it. It's so easy. I'm now just going to be adding a little bit more strength, but just because I wanted to show you. If you go higher in hydration, you need to add a little bit more strength. That's required because your dough is not as dense. It's more elastic. It needs that gluten to be developed. You'll have a more elastic dough that can also be inflated a little bit more when you use more water. So that's a good thing. But for this, we will just be waiting now pretty much until this has reached the desired size increase. And now it's 11 p.m., very late for a German. We always go to bed maybe. 8 p.m. typically, probably, I would say. Other Germans probably agree. Um, 8 p.m. we go to bed after Tages team, and then we wake up at 6 a.m. <laughs> so we wait for this size increase here, and then we're done. That's it. That's all, that's all the magic. That's what I like about this recipe. And for the overnight bread, we're just extra lazy. We just, we just let that sit. We don't worry about it. We don't have to do anything, no coil folds, nothing. That's really, truly just optional. If you go higher in hydration, yes, you have to do that. 
but for this no need approach pretty much oh well actually we're needing now but normally this would not be required and that's what i love about the fermentation sample the one we extracted we just wait until this has the desired size increase and then we are done <laughs> So, <laughs> Jose, you should go to the shop at 6 a.m. like a good German. Yes, you are right. Maybe that's because I'm a software engineer. That's why I don't wake up as early as the average German. <laughs> Susie Kwan, excellent question. I know it's not part of the series. How do how to do coil folds, and is this better than stretch and folds? Um, I'll try to remember that. I can show you how to do a coil fold in a little bit. It's a little bit more gentle, so you will not be degassing your uh, dough as much. That's why those coil folds are quite handy. By the way, this dial-in credentials, only one person dialed in, only one person was brave enough, Herman from Berlin, to dial in. There has to be another person that uh, dials in later on. You can ask me whatever question you like, even if it's just uh, some random stuff. <laughs> so credentials are inside of the description of the video. <laughs> and Susie, I will be showing you that in a little bit. So coil fold is a great technique. We can be doing it now. We can be messing as much with the dough as we want. We're just developing a stronger gluten network. So this is a great thing to do to um, practice and add more strength at the same time. <laughs> Ace, the waiting is the hardest part. How long? Yes. OK, so let me just share my screen one more time. So I developed this small table here. Uh, and based on temperature and based on how much sourdough starter you're using, this tells you roughly for how long. Now, we are, have been here at this. so. Five hours, but no, this is actually for my current sourdough. I'm thinking more that I'm going to be here. So that's where you see the limits of this table. There is some advanced calculation in the background, which you can see right here, but <clears throat> it's not always 100% going to work because the sourdough might be a little bit different. Other things might be different. That's why using the sample is much better. If you are an experienced baker, you will see when your dough is ready. But to get started, you can use this to just get a rough idea, rough ballpark figure, but please don't rely solely on this. Rely on the dough. Okay, so... <laughs> Rockdale asks, Hi there, bottom crust of my loaves ends up being very thick and tough. Any suggestions to fix? Thanks. Okay, hmm. Try to try to use more steam while you're baking your bread. A thick crust is typically a sign of not enough steam. So steam as much as you can, and you will have a smaller crust in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel is making dinner. Good luck on making the dinner. Thanks for joining, Isabel. Truly appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, well, actually, I'm Herman, and I honestly didn't expect to be in a call with the mic on. It was pretty unexpected. Jonathan, Herman, I mean, Herman. Um, yes, thanks for joining. Very brave of you. Uh, greetings to uh, Berlin. <laughs> Kumi says, now it makes sense that you love diagrams. Yes, uh, flowcharts, engineers, we just love them. I don't know. I just have to put everything into flowcharts. <laughs> Yes, Bertos. Um, the link is table.the-bread-code.io. Um, I'm also trying to, if I don't forget, please ping me in a comment or so, then I can share you the link one more time. Else I might be adding it to the description if I don't forget. <laughs> Jose, wow, Jose. You are, this is what Jose just said. He said, Jose said, Autumn Kitchen, always say, listen to your dough, not to your clock. Wow. So, so wise words, Jose. Um, 100 points to Spain. <laughs> 100 points to Spain, Gryffindor. Good job, really. So true. Listen to your dough, not the clock. <laughs> Scott asks, Scott Lane, nice to meet you. Does the poke test work for the dough 
proofing in the fridge. Nope. That's what I don't like about proofing in the fridge. It's not very deterministic. You have to experiment with your own fridge temperature, mess around with it a little bit. It's great, but then it's also not 100% reliable. Finger poke test, the dough is too stiff. It won't work inside of the fridge. That's the only thing I don't like about it. Maybe one of you can figure out a better method and share it with me. I would truly appreciate that. <laughs> Rockdale, I gave him a tip on the steam. You are most welcome. <laughs> okay, so dial in are inside of the description in case you want to dial in, else we will be proceeding now with the main dough. We'll be doing another set of bench kneading. I'll be showing you how to do a coil fold, Susie. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do that. Back to the dough. <laughs> Susie asks, another question. If I want a smaller bowl, when do you cut the dough and how would you bake it? Can I put two Dutch, two, two Dutch ovens in? Yes, I actually do that. I actually sometimes have two Dutch ovens on top of each other, or you might want to have a stone where you can bake them next to each other. You want to divide the doughs uh, after a bulk fermentation, that's what bakers do. So they make one big blob of dough, a big blob, the bulk, that's why it's called bulk fermentation. And then they divide that, then they have to pre-shape that because you have a blob of dough, you wanna make that nice and round. They wait a little bit for the gluten to relax and then they shape. So that's how it's typically done. If you want to have each of them with a more open crumb, then you should be avoiding that pre-shaping if possible, because of course you are evening out your crumb a little bit. So the best open crumb bread is only one coil fold maybe during the bulk fermentation and just let that sit. That's really the trick to get a more open crumb. <laughs> um, so, okay, Suniva SL, who are you? Ah, oh, I'm just a random German, a random baker, and this is my baking channel and i'm actually also wearing a nice christmas sweater go jesus it's your birthday <laughs> okay so uh let's switch back to the dough oh no we have another person Mirko. i need to put on are you ready Mirko? give me a thumbs up then i'll add you to the stream okay so Mirko. hey Hey, how's it going? In both channels. So I close one. <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah. Mirko, where are you from? I'm from Sicily, but I live in Berlin. Ah, Sicily. Yeah, Berlin. I love Sicily. Berlin <laughs> yeah, Berlin is calling. Crazy Come Berlins. On. Yeah. <laughs> so I have two sourdough starters. Mm -hmm. One is Likoli, which is the liquid, the liquid one. And the other one is more the traditional one, right? More like a biga style, a little stiffer. Uh, it's I do usually for the refreshing of the sour of uh, the starter, 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of the um, starter, and 50 grams of the water. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the other one, okay. the liquid is one one one. Mm -hmm. so, okay, understood. But looks like the liquidy is always working much better. Like in the fermentation, works much, much better. Even though in all the recipe that I found, usually the other one is the one that is most used. Um, but I don't know, also the hydration sometimes is, is weird. Because Question to you, is that in Italian, is that the Levito Madre, which you have, which is at lower hydration? Is that Levito Madre? Is? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting that you mentioned this because I read this before that mm -hmm. um, for yeast and bacteria, they, they like to have a little bit more of a, a watery uh, environment. Yeah. So, of course, if you think about this, your dough is a little bit more liquid. This makes it also easier, of course, for the bacteria and yeast to also move around or your dough will be more homogenized. So yeah. I would say that might be the reason why it's more active. I would need to research a little bit why, but I've read this before that this is actually the case. So I can confirm your observation. Yeah. I mean, this one that I have, the liquid one, is coming from München, actually. A lady's mm -hmm. and was uh, 90 years old 
very oh, okay. old. It was before the first world war. <laughs> okay. Started, and it's very very active. I have to say. Okay. The other what question you, that I have. You could be mixing both, and you could be creating a baby out of both. Maybe that's the super starter then. I will do that. I you know, just that. mom and dad, and then your starter, and then you have offspring, and that's going to be. You need to get that starter analyzed if it's that old. Maybe you have some new kind of yeast, some ultra yeast, the super yeast inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will think of labs. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. You wanted to ask another I question. Another question because sometimes, like when I do the mix and I do all the folds, and you let it rest in the fridge or outside of the fridge, um, I see some people that they do just the shaping and they put in the fridge once the shape is done and then it's ready to go to the oven. But some other people, they put the dough in the fridge and they do the pre-shaping and then they wait a little bit, do the shape and after they cook the, the bread. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so I the question one, I'm using the other one, but I don't know what is better. Okay. so. The fridge, I typically only use the fridge during the bulk fermentation in case I want to slow things down. Mm -hmm. Let's say I note my dough is progressing, but I have to leave for whatever reason. Then I will place my dough inside of the fridge. Other than that, I always only bulk ferment at room temperature. Okay. So I would not advise to use the fridge in between. Some people say this might improve the taste a little bit because of course at different temperature, the yeast and bacteria um, ferments a little bit different, but I, I could not confirm this on a level where it's noticeable. Maybe also my taste is not good enough to notice this. So try leaving it at room temperature all the time. <clears throat> and then after shaping, what you can then do is you can put the shaped dough into the fridge. I like to do that when I also have to leave, then it can stay in the fridge for up to 24 hours. And this makes it very easy to just make the it doesn't really change a lot like if you do before or later yes exactly so actually i i showed this one bread that i made before and that was for 200 hours inside of the fridge the yeah. fridge just slows yeah. down everything incredibly so to make the schedule work you can use the fridge but other than that i would go for room temperature and i think i showed this before this small hack here with mm -hmm. a sample jar this definitely give this a shot and then you can experiment with different amounts of salt or starter. If you want it to be slower, you can use less. If you want it to be faster, you can use a little bit more. Cool. Thank you very much. Where are you from, from Sicily? Which area? Palermo, the capital. Palermo, nice. Yeah. I've been in the northwestern part of Sicily once. Um, Bacani? Yes, 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 yes. Very nice. And the wines in Sicily, it's my favorite place, maybe on the world even. I just love the different food the culture, the the nature. This right. island has everything. It's not gentr gentrified and it's a good place to be and it's still cheap to, to go there on holidays. Yeah, it's really nice. And I, I truly appreciate the passion all the Italians have for making food, something we do, Germans don't have as much. Uh, all the ingredients, I mean, for you, regional is if it's coming from the next village, pretty much. For us, regional is if it's from... 500 kilometers away or so. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking the question. Have a Merry Christmas. And um, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Grazie. Ciao. Thank you. Great questions, Mirko. Truly appreciate. Um, if you want to dial in, um, now is your chance. I will be now switching to the dough, however, first. That's fun. That's fun chatting with you. Uh, that's really cool. So back to our dough. I just need to change the camera. Hello. Hello, dough. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, look at how this dough flattened out a little bit. Dirk just dialed in. However, give me five minutes, Dirk. I will just be continuing here on the dough, and then you can, it's your time to speak. So the dough, one more time. Look at how it flattened out. And this is actually something we are using to our advantage. 
the surface area now increased. And this is also what you want to do when you shape your dough. You want to make it a little bit uh, larger in size. This way we have a bigger surface area. This makes it easier to glue the dough together. This thing I'm now doing, some people refer to it as dough lamination. It's pretty much the same thing as, as uh, bench kneading. We just lay out the dough very flat. Mm. And then we fold it over. Let me try to do a small cool hack. <laughs> Ooh, so jiggly. <laughs> Uh, I learned this when I was <clears throat> taking a course in Vienna on making Apfelstrudel. Okay, so dough flattened out and we will be doing the same thing. I'll be wetting my hands one more time and then I'll be taking the dough and I'll fold this into the middle and I glue this dough together. And this creates so much dough strength just by waiting. And same thing from the other side. Don't worry if it tears a little bit, nothing to worry. So this is the dough now. Now I glue it over like this, pull it out and roll it over. And this is our <laughs> blob of dough. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I wanted to show the coil fold. So you see how this dough wants to stay together? I can't even stretch it now. That's because the gluten is so tight right now. <laughs> um, I'll just be trying to show the coil fold Susan asked. Uh, so what you do is you take the dough, you fold this over, then you do the same thing from the other side, and then the same thing from the left side, the same thing from the right side. <laughs> Okay, that was a little bit of a fail, I'm sorry, but this is um, pretty much how you do the coil fold. I'll just be rounding rounding this up one more time. Oops. And this is when the dough scraper might be handy sometimes. You see there's a little bit of uh, uh, dough left here on the surface and the German nature in me wants to use all of the dough. <laughs> Nice looking dough. We even have a pocket here now. This, however, was induced during kneading. So I'm going to pop that. We only want bubbles induced during the fermentation process. Okay. Our dough is ready. I will now be taking this dough. I will be putting this back into the container, into the pot. I like to use a pot because I can just close it with a lid and now it's going to sit in here until this sample here increased in size. That's all the magic. Just going to be cleaning my hands again real quick. Then I'll be right with you, Dirk. So, Dirk, are you ready? Thumbs up if you're ready. Uh, uh, hello. Hey, everybody. I'm going to be adding Dirk now to the stream. Dirk, hello. Oh, yes. Servus. Servus. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm in New Zealand, so it's uh, daytime here. Oh, nice. What a and, nice uh, place summer. to be. Summertime, so that's good. Yeah, we don't have to, um, you know, we, we've got Corona kind of under control here, more or less. Ah, nice. Congratulations. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, listen, I just have a question. Um, a friend of mine has moved to Canada, and she's come across a 120-year-old sourdough starter. And um, mm -hmm. have, you ever, have you ever dried a starter for transportation? Yeah, so I actually made a little bit of a clickbait video a few uh, days ago. It was called How to Store Your Sourdough Starter for 250 Million Years. So, <laughs> okay. I might so have to have a look at that then. You can be drying your starter. What I would recommend you to use is 
10 times the weight of the starter. So let's say you take <clears throat> five grams of starter, then you yep. would take 50 grams of flour. And then you mm -hmm. just make sure you put all that together until it's very dry. Then you can store it for really a very, very, very long time. Okay. So what's going to happen is that the yeast goes into some kind of hibernation mode, and then they will be producing right. some spores. <clears throat> and using yeah. those spores, they can regrow at some point. And then how do you reactivate it? Just by adding water and flour? Or... Exactly. Just by adding water and uh, flour again. And then it might okay. take you a few days to reactivate. Oh, I've got, I've got time. It's not, uh, it'd, it'd just be really interesting to see if, it, if it'll work, you know? I don't even know if it'll make it through customs. That's the problem. That's actually a very interesting point. Uh, I also mailed a friend uh, some sourdough starter dried to the US. I don't know. I did not receive a message yet whether it made it through customs. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll phone customs and just ask them if it is possible to, to get uh -huh. a starter sent through. <laughs> They'll ask you, they're, what the heck is a starter? They're very strict here because of the fauna flora. You know, we've got, we're a little yeah. island, so we don't want any sort of contamination. Yeah. But it's I, great, so it's fine. Yeah, I heard a story about somebody who made a starter in Alaska, and then he went back to San Francisco, and then he sold spoons of his Alaskan master starter. So wow. I'm, I'm also quite curious to see how that starter is going to perform. Yeah, there's a guy here, um, also a German guy, he brought with a starter from Germany. It's 300 years old. Wow. <laughs> so that's, yeah. It's, yeah, I'm, so I started um, this whole journey uh, just through um, uh, last the first lockdown we had, which was, uh, I think it was just February or March of this year. That's mm -hmm. when I, the first time I've ever baked bread. And I now, everyone wants to eat my bread. It is just so damn good. It's incredible, right? How it's just it. flour, water, and salt, and everything yeah. natural. It's crazy. It's just really, really good. And it's also so... Yeah. so so satisfying to make your bread and then eat it, I think. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't bought bread since then, so it's all good. Do you have good flour in New Zealand? Yes. So um, there's a place called Binin, and you just walk in and you can buy it. They just sell it in little plastic bags, um, like a kilo, half a kilo. They've got, um, uh, they've got spelt. They've got rye. Um, then it says strong white flour, which is probably what you mean, like more protein. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be working fine for me. I've had, okay. I've had a few breads that went flat because I over fermented or I don't know. I'm still learning. So yeah, but yeah, they look good. They they're really looking good. The breads and um, yeah, I just uh, I, <clears throat> I've actually I made a bread the other day and I put a little bit of honey in it, mm -hmm. and it gave it quite an interesting taste. It was oh, like that's a, that's interesting. And, How and much honey? It, um, so. Let me just think. So yeah, fifteen grams. Okay. And how much flour roughly did you use? So it's roughly I think it's five hundred grams of okay. flour. But I did a bit of a mix. There's um yeah. so I use um white flour. Um I remember it was a hundred grams of rye, mm -hmm. forty grams of whole meal, mm -hmm. and then oh god, I don't know. I've got the recipe here somewhere. Um and then the I think the, the honey helped with the fermentation because it was, was it a little faster. Uh, well, probably. Yeah. Okay. But what I've noticed now, when I first started, we had winter, right? And so everything was like kind of at a, at a manual. Then I made a, a dough and the thing was just trying to climb out of the bloody container. Yeah. <laughs> so like you were saying earlier with the temperature, it makes a massive difference. The speed. It's two times or three times the speed in summer sometimes. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting... It's, humid here. it's very humid okay. here, so I think, I don't know if that makes a difference either, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's really interesting though is that depending on the temperature, the taste of the bread is also a little bit different. That's why I was trying this 200 hour uh, fridge bread, which was a little bit of a ah. fail. But yeah. so the lower the temperature or the higher, the taste might also be a little bit different. Yeah. I yeah. do that with pizza, with my pizza dough. I put it in, okay. that in the fridge overnight. Because okay. you're at a constant temperature. If you leave it outside it, during the day, it's warm. In the evening, the temperature drops. So you, you're having these fluctuations. Whereas exactly. you actually want it to ferment at a, at a steady rate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. 
and, and so you're, I, you're, you're, you're from oh, oh me uh, i'm a <laughs> crazy story my parents are both from berlin okay i grew up in south africa uh i lived in london and now i'm in new zealand well you have been around yeah and i'm really pissed off because i can't travel anywhere and i'm i'm a vet bumla i love to travel you know? oh yeah i actually wanted to fly to new zealand in november but no. oh have you been <laughs> Never yet, but all of my friends are saying how awesome New Zealand is. So I definitely need oh, to. Oh, it's fantastic! I call it the Garden of Eden. It's really okay. amazing. <laughs> yeah, you, if well, yeah. Let me know if you ever come down. Just I yes, don't know. please, and keep me updated on your sourdough baking. If you have a question, please uh, yeah. send me a message, and yeah, well, I would be curious to know as well on the 120-year-old sourdough starter. Yes, I'll let you know if I get that. If I do, I'll be really happy and I will be posting. I might even make a little video about it. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Ja, danke. Dann schöne Good Weihnachten. Weihnachten. Guten ja. Rutsch. Mach's gut. Ciao. Danke, Dirk. Ciao. Ja. Thank you, Dirk, to New Zealand. Three Berlinians. What's going on with Berlin today? <laughs> so... Let's just quickly go back to the to the charts, to the flow charts and everything. Sharing my screen one more time, just to show you the steps that we did. We ready to stutter. We mixed in the flour and water for the autolysis. We mixed the ingredients. <clears throat> we extracted the fermentation sample. And now all we have to do is wait until that sample has reached the desired size increase. In my case, um, that's around 70 to 110% size increase, and then this dough is going to be ready to be shaped. It's now 11 p.m. I guess this is going to be ready tomorrow morning, 9 to 10 a.m. sometime. So that's what I love about using the small sample. It always makes you ferment on time. So if uh, some of you have questions which I did not answer, <clears throat> then please drop a comment on the stream so that I can reply a little bit later. Next video is going to be the whole wheat sourdough bread. I also still have the Dr. Dough series, which I still have a video to make. I'm sorry for not being so fast on that one. That will be done too. And then super excited. That's going to be the how organic or how the best flour is made. It's a relatively long video, 45 minutes, but it's a great trip that Johannes, who was here earlier <clears throat> in the live stream in the chat, and I did when we were in Bavaria, when Corona was not that bad, of course. And uh, that's going to be very interesting. You'll learn a lot about different wheat, how it's made, what to look out for. Quite exciting video. Um, okay, so let me just, I see one more question from Amund. Thanks for being there, Amund. Uh, greetings to Norway, by the way. Um, so... <laughs> if time creates strength, would kneading or stretch and fold window pane before letting it relax for hours make it too strong at the end? Or is it very hard to make the dough too strong? Excellent question. If you have a kitchen machine, you can be making your dough too strong. It's going to actually tear at some point. And then you can't use your dough anymore. You have to bake it inside of a loaf pan. Uh, but by hand kneading, you can't <clears throat> do it too much. The autolys is, I would say, one part of strength building, but then the actual kneading that we now did is another part. And it depends on what kind of bread you're making, and it depends on what hydration you have for your dough. Depending on that, you either go for the no knead or you go for the knead approach. Right now, I love kneading, but right now I like to focus just on the fermentation process because I think that's the most important parameter. Sorry for saying fermentation again. And that's why I like to go for the no need approach. It just makes you focus on that one variable. That's the most important. <laughs> okay, Sneeko, one more question. Have you ever used Durum or Simolina for bread? Nope, I have not, I'm sorry. In case I missed your question, you have all been amazing. Also, thanks for dialing in. That was a lot of fun. Let's do that again sometime. In case I missed your question, I'm terribly sorry. Please drop a comment on the stream and I'll be replying to that too. <laughs> okay, so stream already quite long. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Dankeschön. Have a Merry Christmas if we don't see each other 
may the gluten be with you and uh, happy baking as always and bake amazing bread i'll also keep you posted of course on how this overnight bread is going hope you learned something it was fun have a blast everybody see you soon i should uh find a way to while i'm saying this press on the end button directly to avoid this kind of awkward moment in the end where the stream is not actually over but you wanted it to be over <laughs> <laughs> see ya